so uh, we, you're in for a treat, of course, during this lecture, but also after. Uh, ice cream from Poslasti Chernica, uh, my humble opinion, one of the, if not the best ice creams in the city, will be served uh, by the partner's wall upstairs, so just on the O level. And of course, you can go ahead and feel free to enjoy as much as you can and as much as they have. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll be handing the floor to you now, so you can you know start with your lecture and uh, have great 30 minutes, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so welcome. Uh, today I'm going to talking about uh, how to convert technical expertise and soft skills into great product. Um, so if you are working in an IT industry, uh, half of this story is going to be really familiar to you. Uh, or if you are working in biology field, also some parts you are going um, to see as familiar parts. So I would like to start with this uh, picture. If you ever saw this picture, um, it's a really important moment in our uh, history of humans, and it presents the first uh, human genome sequenced. So this, these books, or this bookshelf, they contain the whole genome of one person. So historically, this started, let's say, 30 years ago. Uh, the whole project was uh, funded by US government, and they decided that they want to analyze the whole human uh, genome. Before that, that was only done um, in parts, in small chunks, so they decided, okay, let's get a clear picture how the genome looks like. Uh, it took them 13 years to build this bookshelf, uh, so scientists all, all over the world started sequencing small chunks of uh, one person, and at the end they combined all of them, and this is what they got. So as you can see, uh, these books are divided into 23 gr groups which are presenting um, chromosomes. So, but what's in these books? If you, let's say, uh, take any book from this shelf, open any page you want, you're going to get something like this. It's not really understandable, but um, what you can see here is a combination of four letters, A, T, C, G, and they are presenting your genome. So basically in these books, uh, you have somewhere around three billions of these letters. Uh, and they are presenting what you are in a biological way. So uh, while you're looking at this, you probably can't tell anything, but actually these letters are telling everything about you. So in these letters, you can find almost everything about some person what's the eye color, how tall that person is, um, does that person uh, have predisposition to get some disease or anything similar. So everything in a biological way. So that project was really expensive to get this. It cost around five billion dollars, um, and that was for, for only one person, but today uh, technology advanced. So. You can do that now for only a couple of hundred of dollars uh, in a, let's say, in a day, because now we have machines doing that, and those machines are called sequencers. So how does that work? You find the sequencer, then you need to provide, as an input to sequencer, you, know, you need to provide a human sample. Let's get, it can be uh, blood, cells, saliva, anything. That sequencer does some magic inside it. We won't go into details. And at the end of that process, you get a file. So that file basically contains everything that you saw in these books. It contains um, everything about you. So the whole concept now looks like this. At the beginning, you have the data. You're collecting the data about humans you're doing analysis on that data in order to get knowledge about humans. And then with knowledge, you are creating an impact. In this case, it's impact on human lives. So uh, the more data you have, uh, the knowledge that you get from that data is more accurate, so you can make better decisions. 
when you are working um, in bioinformatics. So we as a, as, as a company, as a software company, we are somewhere around here. So we are building tools with software that are helping people to get meaningful data which they can use to create knowledge. With knowledge, they're creating impact. Uh, almost five years ago, when I started working at Seven Bridges, um, when I learned all of this stuff, and when I learned about bioinformatics, and when they told me what bioinformatics does and people in bioinformatics, I thought that they are unicorns, basically. Uh, because that's really a weird merge between two worlds. So on one side you have biology, and you have humans, and on the other side you have technology. Um, so these are really two different skill sets. You need to know how human body works, you need to know what you are looking in data, and then in order to get the knowledge that you want, you need to know programming. And, that's, uh, and all of that is probably done by one person. And um, that was, let's say, a weird, uh, weird set of skills. So today you, s you have somewhere around perhaps a uh, few thousands of uh, bioinformaticians um, in the world. So bioinformatics as in industry is still young. Um, a lot of ha hacking is happening at the moment. Um, I think that they are mostly using, as programming language, they're mostly using R, they're they are using Python, maybe Java, and then at the same time they're they are learning about humans. Uh, this concept may sound pretty abs abstract now, but let's see how that would look in real world. So let's say whenever a person steps in into this room, Without even looking at that person, we want to find um, what's the eye color of that person. And that's our whole process that we want to uh, see. So a person steps in, we want to get a PDF file that says this person uh, has blue eyes and chances that we are wrong is, let's say, 3%. So how we are going to start? We are going to start by taking a sample from that person. So person is stepping in. We are taking a sample. Um, and then we are using se sequencer to get a genome of that person. And then we are getting a file. But what to do with that file? I mean, you have a file that has uh, millions of lines of uh, letters and some random data that it's not, it's, it's not readable to you you need to make analysis. You need to process that file. So as bioinformatician, you're probably going to know what you're looking into that file. So in our case, we want to see uh, eye color, and we are know which part of the genome we are targeting. So we need to find a tool that's going to take whole genome. It's going to split that genome into multiple parts, and it's going to say, OK, this file contains data about eye color. And then we need another script that's going to compare your data. So in order to have accuracy, you need to compare data between humans. So uh, we need to compare file from each person in this room just to have a meaning how accurate data is. So let's see, for example, each person that has blue eyes in this room we want to compare all of them to be sure if we are correct. And this is basically how bioinformatics uh, works now. Uh, they are still hacking a lot. All of this is mostly manual process, so you are losing uh, a bunch of time just to, let's say, to upload the data to some cloud. Then you are losing time to find all of these scripts that you want to use. So imagine. Um, executing each of these scripts manually, and that's a lot of time. And then when you have a data set, for example, let's anal analyze the whole country. Imagine how large data set that would be. For example, one human uh, genome can weight up to perhaps 30 gigabytes. So we are talking about petabytes of data. So we decided to create a product called Rabix. 
Uh, REBIC stands for Reproducible Analysis for, for Bioinformatics. You can probably make a connection between REBIX and REBITS and Reproducible, so you get the idea what we wanted to say. Um, so REBIX is desktop application. It's open source. You can find it on GitHub. And if you ever researched how visual programming looks like, you've probably found a concept like this one. So how it works. On the left side, you have these scripts that we talked about. On the right-hand side, you have a huge canvas. Then you are drag and dropping your scripts, and you are connecting them between. And that's it. it. The concept is pretty simple. Of course, there are steps in how to create this, these scripts and how to write this language, but all of that is a layer below. So what you are doing here, you are creating a workflow visually, and below what we are doing, we are creating a layer of code. And that's it. It's pretty straightforward uh, because all in all these manual processes, you don't want to add another step that bioinformatics uh, people need to do. So this, this uh, example is pretty simple. I found online um, some of real world examples, so they look like this. Uh, someone told me that this thing looks like a uh, sentinel from Matrix. Um, it was the creature from, from the movie. Um, and this workflow presents um, how it looks like in bioinformatics. Of course, you can go even worse. You have stuff like this. This is also a real world example, uh, how that automation that people are using looks like. So here you have probably 100 uh, scripts. Each blue circle presents one script. Um, and below that, you have probably millions of lines of code. And all of that you are presenting with one um, image. And this is how we created the product called Rabix. Um, so when we released it two years ago, people started using it. People adopted this as a product for um, writing these automations, but we uh, encountered some other problems. Uh, the first problem was user experience. So our main product was a cloud-based platform, and what we are offering here is a desktop application. So in bioinformatics, almost everything is in the cloud because you need to share your data with others. Uh, those are huge data sets. You cannot store them locally. And then you need to provide reproducibility, meaning that if I'm doing something today with this workflow and I'm writing a paper about this, 10 years later, if someone wants to get the same results that I'm getting today, we need to provide it. So meaning that all these scripts should exist. All files that we are using should exist in 10 years. And what's, that's one of the biggest problems that bioinformatics is facing uh, at the moment. So you can probably tell, you as a user, you're using web-based platform, and then you're doing your analysis. And at one moment, we say, yeah, but if you want to continue, you need to download desktop application. So that's, that's a really bad user experience flow because we are asking someone to stop what they are doing, to install desktop application, to make a connection with the account, and then to sync the data between um, two applications. That was the pr first problem. Other problems we had, of course, with uh, Windows and Docker running on Windows. We also had problems where um, some users um, they are working in large pharmacies, meaning that they probably have third-party app restrictions. They cannot download uh, desktop applications and so on and so on. So what was the idea? We had to move the rabbit to the cloud. And that's how our second project started. Um, and we did it. That's it. Like, we moved the whole desktop application to cloud. It's working in the browser. Everything is cool. We are offering now um, both products, and that's it. But let's talk why we should have failed. Uh, what I mean by this is um, why we shouldn't 
make this product at the first place and what were the things that we are facing at the moment. So let's start with the team. Um, this is our main engineer. I'm not saying it's his fault, uh, but I just trying to create you a perfect image uh, how the team looked like. So this is Marian and he has a back pain problems. So he's using this ball instead of his chair, but obviously wrong. Um, and at this very moment, so why this moment is, um, is special is because this was at the very beginning of the project um, and we were sharing the same office. And this was super early in the morning. So I started morning like every other morning. I started asking a bunch of questions that we are facing. Um, I started presenting him a bunch of problems that we had with our desktop application. And he was not really enthusiastic about all of that. He's obviously holding his phone. And he's probably thinking I just wanted to do Angular. That's it. I don't care about users and what's happening at the moment. Um, so, yeah, the project started as two-person team. You had Marian as an engineer responsible for this project, and you had me. Um, my field of expertise, my previous field of expertise was user experience, and I spent last couple of years working with users. So all of my focus was how users work, what they are doing, what's their behavior, um, how they are using our products, um, are they frustrated, how intuitive our interface is, and so on, so on. But here, on this project, I stepped in as a product manager for this. And now, on this project, you had this uh, merge between product and engineering. So, when I look back, there's probably a bunch of thing that, things that I'm still missing, but Let's just talk about persons who are uh, doing this. So on one side, you have a user experience guy. As Marian would say, my purpose was to pick colors. Um, on, the, on the other side, you have engineer. And as I would say, he was just copy pasting code from desktop to web. And that was cool. Like We covered small parts of uh, our product, but What's with all, all other things that you need in order to release the product? What's with business? What's with sales? Um, how users are going to learn about this product? Um, how we are going to release it? Who's going to write uh, documentation? How do we include someone from quality insurance? And so on, so on. So as we started working on this, um, since both of these roles were aimed toward the solution. So we were uh, falling in what would someone say, build trap. We are building what's cool for us, but we are not building what's actually solving the user problem or, or uh, what's actually working for our business. Um, and then, of course, after some time, we got more people joining in. But let's also talk why we didn't fail. Um, if, let's say, we were building a car, we started with prototype. And our prototype looked like this. Um, so we decided we had, let's say, somewhere around four months to build the whole thing, to move the whole desktop-based application to work in Chrome. So how we started? We started by building a prototype, and we spent almost half of our time of this prototype. Um, the thing was simple. Let's see what's the happy path for the user. Let's see what's the single thing that we need to have in this prototype in order to prove our concept. If you are thinking about the car, that's probably it. You just need wheels and a base where you're going to sit, and that's it. So we stripped down everything, and it took Marian around seven days to build the whole product, the whole thing that we released after. But there was a catch. Um, half of fun functionalities didn't work. But as we agreed, we are only covering happy path. And why we did this? Because we needed to test our idea. That was the one case. The other case was uh, we are only two persons team, and we need to deliver a huge uh, product. And we need more people stepping in in order to get more information and 
uh, to release the product as you should have. So what's the next thing we did? We told everyone about our car that we are building. First, we went to product design team. We told them, hey guys, we are merging two different products into one. So the problems that we are facing are obvious. First, um, you have two different UIs. Then you have two different front ends, two different technologies. You have two different flows. You have different interactions because in the desktop app, you can use right click, you can use shortcuts, you can use double click. But now when you are moving to web, you cannot use all of that. And we don't have time to think about everything. So we started collecting um, feedback from product design team. Then the next team we went to was front end team. We told them, guys, we built an uh, application that's desktop. We built it by using web technologies, but we used Electron to wrap everything and make it to avail available as desktop application. But the platform that we need is written in Backbone. So now you have Angular, you have Backbone, and you have to make those things work seamlessly and offer as one solution. What we are going to do with that case, uh, we also asked, OK, we have a bunch of uh, public API calls. We need somehow to revert everything to make it work with our internal ser services and so on, so on. We also went to product team, said, is any, anyone building similar car? Like, we, are, we need your inputs. Um, we also went to bioinformatics team and said, you are our end users. You're going to probably use this car, so it's better for you to give us uh, feedback and if you have anything to add. Um, or you're just going to get the thing as it is. So at the end, everyone in the company knew what we were doing. Uh, they, they knew that we are building this ugly car. Uh, so after some time, people started coming to our office and they were like, hey, I was thinking about the car that you're building. I have advice for you. Or in my previous company, I was building the similar car that you are building right now. Here's how we solve this problem. So as a two-person team, uh, we started by inviting more people into this project and telling them what we want to build. Um, we also took OK, my field of expertise is user experience. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to do um, user interviews. So that was our next step. Um, what we did, we started doing usability tests. So that's a really good practice if you're in an IT company to do usability tests with your products, if, if you have. If you don't, you can do it with your colleague. So how it looks? We have a prototype, um, and that prototype fulfills only one path for the user. In this case, was someone needs to open an app. They need to drag and drop scripts. They need to connect them in between, save those scripts, and that's it. That was the only thing that was working at the moment. So we created small tasks, took like a piece of paper, wrote down uh, for user, saying something uh, first, you need to find the script. Then you need to create a workflow to connect all the nodes um, in between. Once when you've done that, you need to save all of your work, and then you need to share it with others, which is basically what people were doing at that moment. And then we went uh, to do usability tests in person. So it looks like I take this laptop, I give a prototype to someone, I show them the task, and I let that person do his job. But uh, next to that person, it's me and Marian, watching how, what does that person, uh, what's, what are the struggles that that person is having um, at that moment. And then you can actually see what's happening with your product. All our things that we wanted to build, um, that we thought that they are cool, are in most cases not usable. People are not, they don't care about that. They just want to fulfill one single um, task. Uh, so next, we also did some remote interviews. Um, so what was the approach? 
If you approach to someone and say, do you need this feature? Do you need this car? Everyone is going to say, yeah, I need it. Nobody is going to say, I don't, because it's better to have something than not to have it. But in most cases, that was wrong, uh, because people are not thinking on that way. They will, always, they will always say, yeah, I need this feature, but they won't stop to think if they are going to use it, in most cases. Uh, so instead of asking them, do you need this car? We ask them, can you tell me what you are doing at the moment? Can you share your screen? Um, can you tell me what problem are you trying to solve? So once when they started doing that, they were literally uh, sharing their screens. They opened Rabix, the thing that we built, and then they said, okay, I'm having problems with connecting with your platform. When I connect the data, uh, I use, usually search for a script. By the way, your search is not working. Uh, once when I find the script, then I drag and drop it into the canvas, and so on, so on. So that way, we could see what they are actually using and how. Because we are building the product, so we know every detail of the product, and we know what's the perfect uh, path for using it. But when you are watching from user side, um, you cannot do that. So at the end, um, as someone who changed um, his field of re interest recently, and as someone who uh, was not so familiar at the time what I'm doing, stepping up as a product manager for this product, this is probably the su single thing that I would outline uh, right now. So the most, uh, most important thing that I learned is you need to talk with people and you need to talk with people a lot, especially if you are not sure in how you are making decisions, um, if you are not sure if you are asking the right questions. But also, you need to make other people talk. In this case, I had to make Marian to go to engineering group to present the problem and to ask them to give him advices on how to take out all desktop parts and then uh, connect them um, with the platform. So that was the project-based um, decision. But as a team, when we were working, one of the most important things that I learned is you need to share how you are thinking at that moment. So as a product manager, you are not a team lead, but you need to make a lot of decisions. And for a bunch of them, uh, you are not sure because that wasn't your field of expertise. In this case, I had to know technology, I had to know design, I had to know bioinformatics, and I also needed to know, is this thing going to sell? Um, so I started sharing my flow of thoughts and how I'm making decisions. So when we sit down and then we started discussing uh, for example, is this going to be a full screen application or is it going to be embedded somewhere? Um, I always shared all the information that I know. So at the end, um, yeah, that's basically it. Like, if you are not sure what you are doing, you just sit with other people. You find uh, people that are expertise in that field. You talk with them and it's way easier for you to make decisions and to help um, other people in your company. Thank you. I guess we have time for uh, questions. You have two minutes for Q&A if you'd like to use it now, or of course you can always visit the booth. Okay. We have a question over there. Product manager. That's. Uh, that's also one of the things that people miss. Is it product or project manager? <laughs> so uh, my previous interest was user experience. I was a designer. For developer, for developer or designer. User experience designer. So meaning that I was mostly doing research, but that also included creating prototypes and working on actual visual design. Um, more questions? You can also stop by our booth, uh, Seven Bridges. I'm going to be there for next, let's say, 20 okay. minutes so we can talk.
Thank you, Brian. Thank and you.